All right, chemistry, this is your video lecture for chapter 8, section 1, describing chemical reactions. You have four different objectives here. The first one is to list three observations that suggest that a chemical reaction has taken place. Uh, these chemical reactions, we cannot actually see them happening at the chemical level with our naked eyes, but we can see different kinds of things happening that indicate that that reaction is taking place. And there are three of those that we'll be responsible for. Uh, list three requirements for a correctly written chemical equation. There is a specific way and a correct way to write a chemical equation, and there are three requirements for that. Write a word equation and a formula equation for a given chemical reaction. And then lastly, balance a formula equation by inspection. Start off with a definition. A chemical reaction is the process by which one or more substances are changed into one or more different substances. In any chemical reaction, the original substances are known as reactants, and the resulting substances are known as products. According to the law of conservation of mass, which we've talked about before in this course and will be a reoccurring theme in this chapter, the total mass of the reactants must equal the total mass of the products for any given chemical reaction. So a chemical equation represents, with symbols and formulas, the identities and the relative molecular or molar amounts of the reactants and products in a chemical reaction. So in a particular chemical reaction, we have reactants and products. The equation using different symbols and then the formulas for compounds, but using those things are going to tell us exactly which compounds or exactly which substances are involved in the reaction and their relative amounts. Um, and the, the chemical equation can be read uh, on a molar scale or a molecular scale. You know, the difference between AMU and grams per mole. For example, the following chemical equation shows that the reactant ammonium dichromate yields the products nitrogen, chromium-3 oxide, and water. Now again, we see the reactants on the left side of the arrow, ammonium dichromate. And then on the right side of the arrow, we see the products, nitrogen, chromium-3 oxide, and water. So here we have a balanced chemical equation. On the left side, we have the reactants. We have two reactants here. We have ethanol, which is the name of this uh, chemical, and oxygen. On the right side of the arrow, we have products. Okay? These are at the end of the reaction. These are the result. Here we have carbon dioxide, gas, and water. The reaction is identified by this arrow. Okay? And it's going to take place, it's going to uh, take the form in... Uh, uh, in this equation right here. We also have the relative amounts denoted by these numbers, these coefficients before the actual chemicals. These are the relative amounts, not absolute amounts, but relative amounts present in each uh, of these reactions. As a human being on this macro scale, we cannot see with our naked eyes these reactions taking place. We can, however, see the results of those reactions. They come in three basic forms. The evolution of energy as heat and light. Now, um, some books will list a fourth or a different uh, identification or indication. That is color change. Color change is a great indicator of a chemical reaction. However, the way our book goes at this is, is it lumps color change in with number one right here. Evolution of energy as heat and light because we're talking about uh, the changes in light. Number two, the, the second indicator of a chemical reaction is the production of a gas. You might see this worded a little bit differently. The evolution of gas or evolution of bubbles, the, cr the production or creation of gas. Something going from solid state or a liquid state to the gaseous state. That in and of itself is not a chemical reaction, but it can indicate that a chemical reaction is happening. And lastly, the formation of a precipitate, but a precipitate is a solid uh, that is produced as a result of the chemical reaction in solution. And in that chemical reaction in solution, 
there separates out from the solution a solid. That solid that comes out of solution is called a precipitate. And then lastly, we have color change. But again, our book is going to lump that into uh, number one. So we're really looking at three uh, as far as our book is wording it and is concerned. Sometimes a chemical reaction will make gas. If this occurs in a liquid, you might see bubbles. For example, when we add vinegar, an acid, to a solution of baking soda, which is a base, a lot of fizzing occurs because carbon dioxide is released. Some chemical reactions produce a precipitate. When a solution of blue tinted Epsom salt is added to a solution of water and household detergent, a precipitate forms. A color change is also a useful indication of a chemical reaction. Indicators, such as phenolphthalein, change color when a solution reaches a certain pH. We can tell that certain chemical reactions have occurred because the pH of the solution has changed. The production of heat or light is a strong indication that a chemical reaction has occurred. Fireworks are a good example of a chemical reaction that produces heat and light. So moving on to the characteristics of chemical equations, things that you're going to see about them. And to relate this to one of our objectives, these are the three characteristics of a correctly written chemical equation. Here we go. Number one, the equation must represent known facts. And so when you're talking about an equation, a reaction, you can't write the equation unless you know everything that is involved in that reaction. For example, uh, a common misunderstanding of a combustion reaction is a, is a lack of understanding that water, H2O, is a product, is a result of combustion. Because in our common experience, uh, combustion, fire, things being consumed by fire, uh, we see that water is not present. It is very hot. It is very dry. In fact, water uh, causes this reaction to stop. However, water is created. You know, typically, it takes a gaseous form and floats away, but it's there. And so if we're going to write a combustion reaction, if we do not include water, we are misrepresenting the reaction, and our equation is going to be flawed. And so we must know all of the players in that reaction. Two, the equation must contain the correct formulas for all of the reactants and products in that reaction. So not only do we have to know all of the players, all of the chemicals on either side of the reaction arrow, we have to know what their correct formulas are. And this is a problem uh, before the idea of diatomic oxygen um, was known. Oxygen was identified, but the formula was not. It was incorrect. It was, it was not known that the type of oxygen that you breathe is actually O2. And so that caused a lot of errors, a lot of erroneous calculations when it came to uh, oxygen reactions. Then lastly, the law of conservation of mass must be satisfied. Okay, this is going to be our, our check at the end of several problems. We're going to see, is the law of conservation of mass satisfied? And the way that we're going to tweak this to make sure that it is, is we're going to have the ability to change coefficients. We're not going to be changing subscripts. In a previous assessment, we asked the question, are you allowed to change the subscripts on a correctly written substance? And the answer was no, because then you're changing the substance that you're talking about. You're talking about a completely different chemical. And if we want to balance equations, for example, making sure that the law of conservation of mass is satisfied, the only thing that we can change are the coefficients. And what that does is it changes the relative amounts of the substance in the reaction. So with that in mind, we want to make sure that we are aware uh, of some of these little pitfalls here. For example, one thing that really messes with students are diatomic molecules. And we've gone over a mnemonic to help you remember this. That's a Brinkelhoff. Uh, these elements, with the exception of hydrogen, make uh, kind of a seven shape on the uh, periodic table. They are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, as I just mentioned, 
fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. When you are reacting something and one of these substances is a reactant or a product and it's just pure hydrogen, for example, or pure nitrogen, for example, it has to be written as H2 or N2. If you simply write 1H, you're misrepresenting that chemical. And as we saw in the previous slide, we have to have the correct formulas for each substance involved in the reaction. Now, the first step in writing a chemical equation is to identify the facts that are to be represented. We have, have to represent known facts. And an easy way to do that is work out a word equation. A word equation is an equation in which the reactants and products in a chemical reaction are represented by words. You're just saying it out loud. And a word equation is easier to get started with because it's qualitative. You're talking about the qualities or the identities of the chemicals involved. For example, if I was going to use a word equation, I would say methane and oxygen react to yield carbon dioxide and water. And this, in fact, is a combustion reaction. But I'm not, I'm not saying how much methane is required, how much oxygen is required, how much carbon dioxide is produced, or how much water is produced. I'm not even actually telling you what the actual formulas for these chemicals are. I'm just telling you the identity. So it's qualitative, not quantitative. The next step is to replace the names of the reactants and products with the appropriate symbols and formulas. Here's where we start to get a little bit more quantitative. Now we're working a formula equation. It represents the reactants and products of a chemical reaction by their symbols and formulas. So let's look at the same example, uh, methane and oxygen reacting. We're going to replace those names, methane, with its formula, CH4. We're going to replace oxygen with its formula, O2. Remember, it's a diatomic molecule, so it's going to be O2 instead of just O. And then carbon dioxide is CO2. Water is H2O. Now I still have not balanced this equation. I have not uh, gotten to my third requirement yet to make sure that the law of conservation of mass is satisfied. But then again, I'm not done yet. This is just step two in the process. I've represented each of the chemicals with their correct formulas. Chemical equations are a way to describe chemical reactions using symbols. The materials undergoing the chemical reaction are the reactants. The materials created by the chemical reaction are the products. Individual atoms and molecules in the reaction are separated by plus signs. The relative amount of each reactant or product is shown in front of the symbol for that substance. Symbols in parentheses after the reactant or product show the form of that substance solid, liquid, or gas. AQ stands for aqueous and indicates that the substance is dissolved in water. Products and reactants are separated by an arrow indicating the direction of the reaction. If arrows point in both directions, the reaction is reversible. The products of this reaction can undergo another reaction that turns them back into the starting materials. If something is required to make the reaction progress, such as heat, pressure, or a catalyst, it is shown over or under the arrow. Continuing on uh, our last step, we have to make sure that the law of conservation of mass is satisfied because it's a law. It has to be accurate. It has to be maintained. That means that the relative amounts of each reactant and product represented in that equation must be adjusted so that the numbers and the types of atoms are the same on both sides of the equation, the reactant side and the product side. Now, this process is generally referred to as balancing an equation, and it is executed by not changing subscripts, but by changing coefficients, okay, the big numbers in front of each term. To balance an equation, uh, begin by counting atoms and elements that are combined with uh, atoms of other elements and that appear only once on each side of the equation. So I would find, I would pick carbon, for example. Carbon is already balanced in this equation. There's one carbon on the reactant side, there's one carbon on the uh, product side. This means that I'm going to maintain a coefficient of 1 there. But then I'm going to move on and I'm going to identify that two additional hydrogen atoms are needed on the right side 
of the equation because on the left side I have one methane, on the right side I have one carbon dioxide, but I have four hydrogens per one methane. Over on the product side, only having one water molecule, that's only two hydrogens. I need two more hydrogens on the right side in order uh, to have four hydrogens on both sides. So I simply insert a coefficient of two in front of the water. So I'm continuing to balance. This is partially balanced now. I've considered the carbon. I've considered the hydrogen. Last is to consider the oxygen. So I'm going to increase the number of oxygen atoms on the left side to four, okay, four oxygens, uh, by placing a coefficient of two in front of the molecular formula for oxygen. Remember, it's diatomic. And so the correct, uh, uh, the correct chemical equation or the balanced formula for the burning of methane and oxygen is one CH4 plus two O2s react to yield one CO2 and two H2Os. Uh, you're going to be seeing these symbols very, very regularly. So it's going to be very important that you get used to these. Um, the reaction arrow means yields or reacts to form. This is the action uh, symbol here. If you see two arrows going in either way, that simply means that the reaction is reversible and we can go the other way as well. Uh, we also see three, or sorry, four different states of phase. We have S representing solid or uh, you know, precipitate specifically because precipitates are in the solid state. Um, instead of S to represent a solid, if you're specifically saying that a precipitate is being formed, you can actually use a down arrow. We're not going to use that all that much in this course, but it is a thing that exists out there. Um, the other three, we have the, um, th uh, three more states of phase. We have the liquid state. We have aqueous, meaning it's a solution. Uh, that means to be dissolved in water. And then lastly, we have the gaseous state. Here's some more. Uh, we have the opposite of the precipitate. We can uh, indicate a gaseous product by an up arrow. Uh, when you put something on top of the reaction arrow, so you have a whole bunch of different things on top of the reaction arrow. We have the delta, or, or heat. We have two atmospheres. We have pressure. We have a particular temperature. Um, we have a substance on top of the arrow. All of those things are required for that reaction to take place. So with the delta or the heat, that means the reactants are being heated. Heat is required uh, to be added to this reaction for it to happen. Uh, to ATM, that's a unit of pressure. That means this reaction is only going to be carried out with a certain amount of pressure, in this case, two atmospheres of pressure. Uh, we also have just a generic word, pressure represents normal atmospheric pressure. We can have a specific temperature identified. This reaction will only take place at this particular temperature. Or if we have a substance on top of that arrow, that's indicating that that substance is being used as a catalyst, as a catalyst, which means it's not consumed or changed by the reaction, but it does alter the rate of the reaction. Typically makes it go faster. Um, and again, here is a chart with all of these things. Please refer to this chart regularly. This is going to be very useful. These questions will appear on your quiz. And so looking at all of these, uh, looking at all these ideas, all these symbols, this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing CH4 plus O2 reacting to yield carbon dioxide and water. Here we have the balanced version of the equation. And this is what it's representing using, uh, if we look at a model system. So we have C4, one green sphere, and four blue spheres. Uh, carbon, uh, carbon being represented by the green sphere, hydrogen being represented by the blue sphere. And you notice on both sides of the reaction arrow, okay, left and right, there are four blue spheres. On both sides of the reaction arrow, there is one green sphere. And on both sides of the reaction arrow, there are four red spheres. That means that the law of conservation of mass is being satisfied. We're going to end up with a few sample problems uh, working out here. Uh, write a word and formula equation for uh, the chemical reaction that occurs when solid sodium oxide is added to water at room temperature and forms sodium hydroxide being dissolved in water and include the symbols for the physical states in the formula equation. This is going to be an important thing. Include the symbols for the physical states. Then balance the formula equation to give the balanced chemical equation. So the word equation is going to show the reactants sodium oxide and water to the left of the reaction arrow. 
the product, sodium hydroxide, it has to be on the right side because it's a reactant. So I'm going to start with my word equation like so. Now, sodium is going to have an oxidation state of plus one. Uh, <coughs> and uh, oxygen usually has an oxidation state of minus two. And a hydroxide ion is going to have a charge of minus one. So we move to a formula equation, but it's not going to be balanced, of Na2O reacting uh, with H2O to yield NaOH. Okay. Now this is not balanced, but this is simply inserting the formulas for the words, the qualitative nature of the names. Next step, I'm going to uh, add symbols for the physical states of the reactants and products, and then the coefficient 2 in front of NaOH, the sodium hydroxide, uh, to balance the equation. So here I have coefficients. I also have states of phase. Lastly, uh, I would like you guys to translate uh, this chemical equation into a word equation, into a sentence. So please press pause now. Now let's see how we did. We have all the information, all the qualitative and quantitative information here in this chemical equation, this formula equation. But we're going to take that balanced equation and put it into a word equation. This is how you would read it out loud. Aqueous solutions of barium and chloride. Okay, barium chloride and the uh, uh, sodium chromate, they're both going to be aqueous. Okay. Uh, react to produce a precipitate of barium chromate and sodium chloride also in aqueous solution. Going back, we see the barium chromate and the sodium chloride, um, sorry, the, uh, the sodium chloride in the aqueous state, uh, the barium chromate in the solid state because it's a precipitate. Again, how do we know that this is a precipitate? Because to begin with, there was no solid. Notice both of the reactants, aqueous state. Looking over at the product side, we have one solid state uh, chemical. That means that it is precipitated out of solution because there was no solid to begin with. All right, guys, that's going to finish up the first part of our video lecture. I will see you next period.